All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, cover crop species, some of the different seeds one might choose to um, go to plant cover crop seeds in your garden or farm setting, depending upon the goals that you're trying to accomplish, and then also the sort of seasonal parameters, whether that's available rainfall, frost, and, and uh, cold sensitivity that some of this, these seedlings or seeds may have. Um, those are going to be some of your considerations for sure. Um, in the resources that we have discussed previously, there is a whole suite of considerations that we want to think about. Um, are we trying to build organic matter in the soil? Yes, virtually always that's going to be a goal. Are we trying to improve soil structure? Yes, that's almost always going to be one of your primary goals. Do you have a hard pan or plant, plow pan or some impermeable layer in your sub soil that you need to break through. That maybe isn't always a goal, but if it is, there are certainly ample opportunity to opportunities in terms of crops to address an issue like that. Do you need to improve drainage and aeration? Well, that, that kind of ties back to soil structure and, and overall soil health. Um, are you trying to fix nitrogen with the combination of legumes and rhizobial bacteria? Um, there's lots of opportunities to do that. Are you hoping to do that in the cool season or are you wanting to do that in the warm season? Those will those sorts of parameters will help inform your choices. Do you have access to irrigation or rainfall? Or are you expecting the um, cover crop to do most of its work with little or no rainfall or irrigation because your water resources are, are scarce? If that's the case, that's gonna also be an important determining factor in what seed you might choose. Um, so to lean into some of that, I wanted to just point out a few of the different things here. This, this first couple of rows of seed that we have here are some of the legume options that you might consider in, in your um, seed sowing. Um, a couple of warm season cover crops that um, would be possibilities would be something like the cowpeas and the lab lab. Um, here in Santa Cruz, these are not actually very optimal choices because you really need a bit hotter conditions. But in Southern California, in the Central Valley, in other warmer interior places, those would be outstanding summer cover crops for nitrogen fixation and plant uh, and building biomass um, for improving soil organic matter. On the coast, a couple of um, other alternatives that we might use um, would be things like sub clover and crimson clover, but though those are more of a more of a cool season crops. Um, in this instance, you'll see that they the seeds look to be kind of gray. That is actually because the seeds themselves are embedded or coated in a rhizobial bacteria, the nitrogen fixing bacteria that's really going to do the work of harnessing the atmospheric nitrogen, capturing that nitrogen, converting it and putting it into a plant available form. Um, some seeds, especially the smaller seeds, you can buy in that rhizo-coated form where it's a clay bacteria coating. Um, most of the larger seeds, things like the cow peas, um, the lab lab, bell beans, vetch, um, we would actually need to either buy them where they've already been inoculated, where they've been dusted in a powder, um, which this, um, the, this is a, a pea and bean combo. So there's actually several species of different rhizobial bacteria in here so that this, um, this inoculant can work with several different species of legumes. Um, but we would dust and coat those seeds prior to planting them so that when the seeds germinate and the roots emerge, the roots are in immediate contact with the rhizobial bacteria and that relationship can unfold right away. In our region, um, really, really common winter or cool season cover crops would be one of many different species of vetch. This particular uh, vetch here, um, this is a, a purple vetch, but there are many different options um, that, are, that are available to you, all serving pretty similar purposes, but um, depending on your location, one or another may be a stronger grower. And then these are bell beans, the Vicia faba, that are used as a cover crop. And this is really, they're really the foundation of our winter cover crop in terms of biomass, strong taproot, really, really substantial nitrogen fixation. Um, and so we love those as a, as a 
as a winter cover crop for us. I wanted to make the contrast though, actually I'm bring this back up, between bell beans, which are really grown principally as a soil crop, as, a, as food for the soil, um, and then this one here, fava beans, which is really grown principally as food for humans. Um, these could also serve as a cover crop, but if you're harvesting the fresh beans in the, in the green uh, pod state or letting them, them go to the full dry bean state, some of the nitrogen that would have been fixed by those plants gets translocated and moved into the seed and isn't going to be available to your soil system. So the fava beans are an outstanding food crop. But um, if you grow them as a cover crop and harvest the food value, you're making a little bit of a trade-off. Some of their benefit as far as nitrogen fixation goes is really going to be lost. But the, the benefits in terms of their root nature and their, the biomass that they produce, that will certainly still be available to you. Um, so just an important distinction there. Um, another thing to note is what we most commonly do here and is a very common practice is to sow a mix sometimes referred to as a soil builder mix we just have it labeled here as farm mix but this is a combination of two different species of vetch the bell beans oats and then also some field peas a winter growing pea so we um actually have about 90% legumes, <clears throat> excuse me, and 10% cereal crops. Um, and they are sown side by side um, in rows, in the, in the rows or the drills together all at one time. And then they essentially grow as an intercrop. Um, and there's some huge benefits to that. The cereals uptake nitrogen from the soil, encouraging the legumes to better harness the bacteria relationship so that they bring new and more and new nitrogen into the system. Um, and the cereals also have this phenomenal network of fibrous roots. Um, and they, um, those do a, a huge job of holding the soil in place against erosion. They also are really outstanding at helping to build soil structure by virtue of them contributing organic matter throughout the soil profile, but also from from some of their protein exudates, glomalin and other substances that the roots um, exude. And then that specifically helps actually bind sand, silt and clay particles together um, to form soil aggregates. And that can happen with any number of different cereals. In our climate, we tend to favor the oats. The seeds are generally less expensive. They mature a little bit later and give us a lot of biomass and uh, don't have much disease susceptibility. Some folks really, really like barley as a winter cover crop, as the winter cereal. Um, and that's a great choice, but in our area, they tend to mature a bit more early and sometimes are a little bit susceptible to rust so you don't get as much biomass and vigor out of them. Wheat is another option. Um, and all of these cereals could be grown as individual stands um, and then even harvested as a food crop, um, but in a mixed setting where like in our, uh, in our soil builder mix, it's gonna be a lot harder to harvest individual seeds because the crop is interspersed with one another. Um, in our climate, those are all basically cool season crops, but um, if we were to irrigate in the summer, they also would grow just fine right through the summer months. A couple of other options I would want to point out is cereal rye. A lot of people really like cereal or annual rye because it is a very, very vigorous plant. Um, it's also quite cold tolerant, so this is one that is used in, uh, in mountainous climates and in like the northeastern United States and other places because it will slow and essentially go dormant um, through the winter. Um, but it has the ability to withstand some winter conditions. Um, it may get killed to the ground at a, completely, but at least then it um, gives you a, a dead vegetation mulch to cover and protect your soil. An alternative um, for longer term growth and that is more cold tolerant is a perennial rye. Um, this would be used in sort of a green forage or green fallow period um, where you have both a forage crop as well as a crop that is going to hold and restore soil um, over a longer period of time. Even 18 months to two plus years growers would leave the perennial rye in place and be able to use that in a 
can contribute tremendously to building soil quality. Um, and it's a tool that is sometimes used in the no-till type setting as well. One other variety that I'd really like to highlight is Sudan grass. Um, this is a huge biomass producer, even in our mild coastal climate, it will easily grow six plus feet tall. If it's sown early enough in the season, you could grow it to three or four feet tall and mow it, and it will regrow and, and put out um, several more feet of growth. Here in the Central Valley in California, they may get two plus six foot stands in a single season grow it to six foot mow it it's often harvested and used for silage um, as cattle feed and then irrigate and regrow and get another massive stand out of it huge fibrous root system deep probing roots throughout the soil profile horizontally and vertically Out outstanding crop um, and then the last couple of things as a quick highlight would just be some non-cereals as possibilities. Buckwheat is one that we really, really like. It's a, a very quick growing summer annual, warm season annual. From sowing to flower is typically only about 45 days. Um, produces a moderate amount of very tender succulent um, biomass that can be readily mowed and incorporated um, between say an early season crop and a later season crop to uh, contribute organic matter back to the soil, keep the biological processes in motion. And perhaps one of the most greatest values about this is that when it's in flower, the buckwheat is just an absolute mass of small white flowers that are a uh, a tremendous nectar and pollen resource. And um, that can be a great cyclical or sort of successional process if you can keep successions going through the season to provide nectar and pollen resources for your parasitoids and predators that you're hoping to welcome into your operation for biological control. Um, mustard is another strong possibility. Um, here it is mostly grown as a cool season crop. Like the rye, it's got some allelopathic uh, properties, so it is good at suppressing other weeds and other species um, and produces a moderate amount of biomass. Can be a good bee forage as an alternate um, resource, especially coming out of winter. And then one last thing I just want to mention, um, not so much as a cover crop and for biomass, but back to the idea of what the buckwheat can provide. Um, we've also got uh, sweet alyssum that is something that we use regularly um, interspersed between our rows or sometimes even under undersown in our um, primary crops as a tool to bring beneficial insects into the system and simultaneously create a small amount of biomass to benefit the system. So yeah, that's a bit of a look at some of some of the possibilities. This is by no means exhaustive, but give you some perspective on uh, legumes, cereals, and some of the non-legume, non-cereal options that are available to you.